Good morning, dear students. Uh, today we are going to solve May June 2015 2 1 paper. The course we are studying is Physics 5054. My name is Farhan Mazar, and let's start today's paper. In this video, we will solve only the section A of this paper. Section B of this paper, we will solve in another video. Okay. So, on your screen, you can see question number one. Um, figure 1 1.1 shows the distance time graph for two cyclists, A and B. They start a 500 meter race together, but finish the race at different times. So, on your uh, screen, you can see here we have a distance time graph. And on the x-axis, the time is represented. And on the y-axis, uh, distance is represented. Um, there are two graphs. One is for the cyclist A and one is for the cyclist B. Using the figure 1.1, use the figure 1.1 to determine the distance between A and B at the time equals to 20 seconds. So let's go back to the diagram. Let's increase the size. Okay. So on your screen, you can see that I have that distance time graph. The question was, when the time is 20 seconds, when the time is 20 seconds, what is the... Uh, distance covered by A and what is the distance covered by B and then we have to calculate what is the difference of the distance covered. So from 20 second if I go to the distance time graph the distance covered is 200 and from 20 seconds if I go to the graph of A the distance covered is 260. So if I want to find the difference of the distance covered that will be 260 minus 200 and the answer will be 60 meter. I have done this on a graph on, on a separate paper. Let me show you my work. Okay. On your on your screen, you can see distance covered by A is 260 meter. Distance covered by B is 200 meter, and the difference of the distance traveled is 260 minus 200, and the answer is 60 meter. Okay, the next part is, he says, the difference in the time taken by A and B for the race. This is a 500 meter race and we have to find out how much time the both took. Okay, on your screen, I hope you can see this. Uh, the A completed the race here, so check what is the time. It is 38 seconds and the B completed the race here, so check what is the time. The time is 50 seconds. So the difference, the difference of time is 50 minus 38, and the answer will be 12 seconds. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So on your screen, uh, if second part is the time taken by if the body A is 38 seconds, and the time taken by the body B is 50 seconds, and the difference of the time is 50 minus 38, and the answer is 12 seconds. I hope you have understood it. Okay, let's move to the next part, reduce the size, okay. So the next part is on your screen, you can see that. The next part on the screen is B part. He says uh, the cyclist, the cyclist uh, starts the race at the same time as A and B. Cyclist C starts the race at the same time as A and B and covers the first 200 meter of the race at a constant speed of five meter per second. He then accelerates and finishes the race at T is equal to 60 seconds. On the figure 1.1, draw the distance time graph for the cyclist C. 
it's a two mark question you see the cyclist c started the race at time zero so the one point which you have to plot on the distance uh, distance time graph is 0 comma 0 he covered 200 meter uh, with a speed of 5 meter per second so suppose let's calculate how much time it will take to cover 200 meter so divide 200 meter with 5 meter per second and the answer will be 40 second so plot a point on the speed time graph uh, whose coordinates are 40 comma 200 so you see till now you have plotted two points on that distance time graph one point is uh, 0 comma 0 and the other point is 40 comma 200 he then he, he says that he then accelerates and finishes the race at 50 seconds so here we got the third point to be plotted on the distance time graph and uh, the race was of 500 meters he said on 60 second he completed the race so 60 comma 500 this is the third point which you will plot on the distance time graph join the 0 comma 0 and the 40 comma 200 point with a straight line and join the 40 comma uh, 40 comma 200 and the 60 comma 500 with a uh, with an increasing curve or you can also join it with the straight line but it will be better if you join it with an increasing curve I have done this on a paper let me show you my work I hope that this is uh, visible to you. Let me reduce the size a little bit. So this, the whole thing is clear to you. Okay, so here is that distance time graph, the A and the B. They are the graphs which were already drawn there. They are, I represented them with the blue color. And this black color graph is the graph for the body C. I have plotted two points. One is the 0 comma 0. The other point is uh, 40 comma 200. And the third point I plotted is 60 comma 500. I joined the, these two points with a straight line and these two points, 40 comma 200 and 60 comma 500, you can join them with an increasing curve. You can join them with an increasing curve to show that the body was accelerating. I have joined uh, the diagram which I draw. I have joined them with a straight line, but you join them with the increasing curve. Increasing curve will be like this. Little the curve whose gradient is increasing. So I hope that you have understood this. Okay, now we are moving to the next part. The second part uh, of the B he says calculate the average speed of the cyclist C for the whole race. If you want to find out to calculate if you want to calculate the average speed for the whole journey the process is simple you take the total distance covered and you divide it with the total time taken total distance covered divided by the total time taken so the total distance covered is 500 meters and the total time taken is uh, 60 so the answer will be 8.3 meter per second I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So here we go. Average speed is equals to total distance divided by total time equals to 500 meter divided by 60 and the answer is 8.3 meter per second. So this was question number one. I hope that it is clear to you. Now we can move to the next question. Uh, that question is question number two. Okay. Here we go. Uh, figure 2.1 shows a student doing a press up, a total force Fx upward on his hands. There is also a force upwards on his toes. 
the weight of the student is 600 newton and the weight of the student is 600 newton and this force acts downward from the center of the mass explain the question is explain why the student does work as his body rises from the ground to see the boy applied the force in upward direction with his hands and the bo his body moved in the upward direction so because the body has moved in upward direction the body has moved in the direction of the force that's why the work is done so i have written this answer also let me show you that okay on your screen i hope you can see we can raise the size Okay, question number two, A part. He applied force F by his hand and his body moved in direction of force. So that's why the work is done. Okay, so move to the next part. He says, second part is state the form of energy that the student uses to do this work. The energy in the human muscle, that energy is called chemical potential energy chemical potential energy okay on your screen we have the b part and it says that the the at the position shown in the figure 2.1 the student is stationary the weight of the student causes a moment about his toes calculate the moment of the weight of the student about his toes uh, okay let me go to back to the diagram you see here the weight of the student is acting the weight of the student is acting downward the weight is 600 newton so this is the line of action of the weight and here is the pivot the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the weight and the pivot is 0 0.80 meter this weight is trying to produce an anti clockwise moment so if you want to calculate the moment, the formula will be weight multiplied D. So it will be 600 Newton multiplied 0 0.80. And the answer will be 480 Newton meter. 480 Newton meter. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you that. On your screen, B first part, moment is equals to F multiplied D equals to 600 multiplied 0 0.80 and the answer will be 480 Newton meter. Okay, the next part is, the B second part is, calculate the value of the force F. Okay. You go back to the diagram you see here this force is question but remember this is toes are the pivot this force is acting here this force is trying to produce a clockwise moment and his weight is producing an anti-clockwise moment because the body is in equilibrium so the clockwise moment and the anti-clockwise moment they both will be equal to each other but you know because here this is the line of action of the force F. Its perpendicular distance from the pivot is 0 0.4 plus 0 0.8, 1.2 meter. So the clockwise moment is equal to the anti-clockwise moment. So F multiply 1.2 equals to the anti-clockwise moment was 480, 600 multiplied 0.80. So F multiply 1.2 equals to 600 multiply 0 0.80. So F is equals to 480 divided by 1.2. F is equals to 400 Newton. So we have got the value of the F. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you that. On your screen, you can see clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment. F1, B1 equals to F2, D2. F multiply 1.2 equals to 600 multiply 0 0.80. F is equals to 600 multiply 0 
which will give you an answer of 480 divided by 1.2 and the answer will be 400 newton so the value of the f is 400 newton i hope that you have understood this okay an experiment is carried out to find how the pressure of a fixed mass of air at room temperature varies with volume because 3.1 shows the apparatus used the syringe is sealed at one end and the piston and the piston is free to move up and down as different metal weights are used so here you have a syringe and here we have a piston and we have put uh, weights on the piston inside this and the syringe we have air this end of the syringe is sealed this is figure 3.1 A part of question number three is state the unit in which pressure is measured. We have different units for measuring the pressure. Pressure is measured in Pascal. The pressure is measured in Newton per meter square. Pressure is also measured in Newton per centimeter square. Pressure is also measured in centimeter of mercury. Pressure is also measured in millimeters of mercury. Pressure is also measured in atmosphere. Atmospheric pressure, one atmospheric pressure, two atmospheric. So you can name any unit here. B part is figure 3.2 shows the axis for a graph of pressure against volume for the air in the syringe. One point is plotted on the graph at the pressure of P naught and the volume v naught so you see when the volume is 1 v naught the pressure is 1 p naught this question is the time the temperature of the air is kept constant on figure 3.2 plot points at the volume of 0 0.5 v naught and 2 v naught you see The temperature is constant. When the temperature is constant, the pressure and the volume, they are inversely proportional to each other. In the case of the gas, if temperature is kept constant, the, the pressure of the gas and the volume of the gas, they are inversely proportional to each other. At volume 1 V naught, the pressure was 1 P naught. So his question is, what will be the pressure when the volume is 0 0.5 V naught? 0 0.5 V naught means that you have uh, reduced the volume to half. So when you have the volume, the pressure will become double. So you will plot a cross here. When the value of the V 0.5 V naught, the pressure will be 2, 2 P naught. And when the volume is 2 V naught, you have doubled the volume. When you double the volume, the pressure will become half. So the pressure will become 0 0.5 V naught. So I will plot the third, second point here. So then I will have one point here, one point is here already, and one point will be here. Then I will join them. Then I will join them with a uh, with a curve, with a best fit curve. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you the curve. Okay. So this is question number, let me reduce the slide a little bit. Here is this, that curve, you, you can see clearly that I have plotted three, um, three, one point was already given, I plotted two points and then I joined them with a smooth curve. I hope that this is clear to you. Okay, so, Next part of this question is, here we have, 
it says uh, it's a three mark question he says more metal weights are placed on top of the syringe explain how the molecule of the air inside the syringe are able to support more metal weights you see when you will put more weight on the on that piston that piston will move a little bit downward when the piston will move little bit downward then what will happen the volume of the air inside the syringe will decrease now there will be less number of air molecules per unit volume and due to this sorry i said the wrong sentence i said there will be less number of air molecules per unit volume no there will be more number of air molecules per unit volume sorry i said the wrong sentence there will be more number of air molecules per unit volume so the collision frequency with the walls with will, will increase and on a unit area of the wall there will be more number of molecules colliding more number of air molecules will be colliding so there will be more force exerted per unit area so that's why the pressure of the air inside the syringe will increase so that's why the air is able to support the extra load which you have put on the syringe i have written this answer um, uh, let me read that also okay i hope it's visible let's increase this sign also okay question number 3 c part when more metal weights are placed on top on the syringe top of the syringe piston moves little downwards number of gas molecules per unit volume increases collision frequency of the gas molecules with walls of syringe and piston increases so greater force is applied in upward direction on piston due to which air is able to support extra metal weights on top of the syringe so this was the c part question number 3 c part i hope this is clear to you okay we are moving to the next question on your screen question number 4 is on your screen figure 4.1 shows a wave on a string the wave is traveling towards the right describe the movement of the particles of the string you see the string is the medium through which the wave is traveling the wave is traveling from left to right and the wave is a transverse wave here we have troughs and the crust and you know the the particles or the of the medium or the, of the string they will be moving up and down they will be doing the vibratory Uh, motion about a mean position so they are moving up and down perpendicular to the direction of transfer of energy so it was a a two marks question so the particles of the string are vibrating they are vibrating up and down and they are vibrating perpendicular to the direction of the wave or perpendicular to the direction of the transfer of energy i have written this in a, on on a paper let me show you my answer question number 4 a part is on your screen particles of the string move up and down perpendicular to the direction of propagation of energy okay so we move to next question b part determine the wavelength of the wave and the c part is the speed of the wave is 2 meter per second calculate the frequency of the wave so first of all 
we need to know what is the wavelength of the wave. We go back to that diagram. Let me increase the size so you can see it clearly. Okay. So on your screen, yeah, on your screen you can see uh, figure 4.1. So the wavelength is from one peak to the next peak. The, the distance between the two peaks, that is known as the wavelength. So this peak is at a distance of 0 0.05 meter, and this adjacent peak or consecutive peak is the, at 0 0.45 meter. So the distance between them is 0 0.45 minus 0 0.05 meter, and the answer will be 0 0.40 meter. So the wavelength is 0 0.4 zero meter. I have done this on a paper also. Let me show you my working. So wavelength is equal to 0 0.45 meter minus 0 0.05 meter and the answer is 0 0.40 meter. The next question is if the speed of the of the wave is two meter per second, find the frequency. You know the Formula for the formula which relates the speed, wavelength, and the frequency um, is V is equals to F lambda. If you want to find out F, the formula will become V divided by lambda. The velocity is 2 divided by 0 0.40, and the answer will be 5 hertz. So this was the C second part. 5 hertz is the is the answer. Okay. So let's reduce the size. Okay. So we are done with the C first part. And okay, the next part is on your screen. Second part on figure 4.1 draw the string at a time 0 0.10 second later than the time in the figure 4.1. Remember this thing 0 0.10 second. The frequency. The frequency was given as 5 hertz. We just calculated the frequency in the upper part. The frequency was 5 hertz. From the frequency, I can calculate the time period of the wave. Time period of the wave is equal to 1 by F. So 1 divided by 5, and the answer will be 0 0.2 seconds. So in 0 0.2 seconds, this is the time period. So he says, what will, what will be the position of the string at 0 0.1 second? The time period is 0. Point. Uh, let me show you that graph again. OK, figure 4.1 is in front of you. So this is a one instance. And remember, after 0 0.2 seconds, which is the time period, the particles of the string will be back again in the same position, which is shown here. After one time period, which is 0 0.2 seconds, the string will be back in the same position, which is shown in the figure 4.1. But his question is, what will be the position of the string when the time 0 0.1 second has passed? 0 0.1 second is half of the time period. So every point, every particle of the string, whatever is his position and location on this diagram, after 0 0.1 second, it will be on opposite position. I mean, if a point is on the peak, after 0 0.1 second, it will be at the bottom. And the points which are at the bottom, they will be on the top. Let me show you how I drawn. Uh, here I can also tell you, the string which is here, it will be here. The portion which is here, it will be here. The string which is here, it will be here. And the string which is here, it will be here after 0 0.1 second. 
I have done this on a paper. Let me show you on your screen. See, second part is showing. Time period is equals to one by f equals to one by five equals to zero point two second. So after zero point one second, the black wave will be. What will be the location of the black wave? The I showed the wave with the black color. Uh, it will be uh, its position will be the blue colored wave. Exactly opposite. Okay, so the points which are in the peak, they will be in the in the crust. The points which are in the crust, they will be in the trough. Sorry, and the points which are in the trough, they will be in the crust. The points which are on the peak, they will be at the bottom. The points which are at the bottom, they will be on the top. I hope that it is clear to you. Okay, dear students, let's move to the next question. Let's reduce the size. Question number. Okay, question number five is on your screen. Figure 5.1 shows a tray of light entering and passing along an optical fiber. Here you can see here we have a piece of optical fiber. It's a glass. So light is entering into the optical fiber. The angle of incidence is 50. The angle of refraction here is 30. And he says calculate the refractive index of the glass in the optical fiber. If you want to calculate the optical uh, refractive index of the glass, so I can apply the Snell's law here. And the formula of the Snell's law is N equal sine I by sine R. N equal sine I by sine R. So N equal sine 50 divided by sine 30. Sine 50 divided by sine 30. Do this calculation on your scientific calculator and the value of the N will be 1.5. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my working. Question number five. Question number five, A part is on your screen. N is equals to sine I by sine R, sine 50 divided by sine 30, and N will be equals to 1.5. I hope you have understood this. B part. He says, explain why explain why the ray of light is totally internally reflected at A. It's a two mark uh, explanation. So you can on the diagram, you can see when the light hit this boundary of the glass, the process of total internal reflection took place. The question is why this happened. You know, the light was traveling in an optically dense medium. The light was traveling in an optically dense medium and then it tried to enter in the optically rare medium. The angle of incidence in the optically dense medium, if it is more than the critical angle, if the angle of incidence in the optically dense medium is more than the critical angle, the process of total internal reflection will take place and the light will not enter into the rare medium, optically rare medium, but it will bounce from the boundary and it will be reflected back into the optically dense medium. So this is what has happened at the point A. The process of total internal reflection has taken place. I have written this answer also. Let me... Uh, this was the question explained why the ray of light is totally internally reflected at A. I have written this answer. Let me read my answer to you. Okay, so B part, the answer. Uh, so B part is in front of you. Angle of incidence in optically dense medium is more than critical angle of glass at point A. Due to this, light will not enter in optically rare medium light will undergo total internal reflection at the point A. So I hope that you have understood this question, this explanation. Okay, 
the steel part is both optical fiber and copper wire are used to transmit data optical fiber is cheaper and can carry more data per second than copper wire state one other advantage of using optical fiber rather than copper wire to transmit data okay you know when the signals are sent through the any wire whether it is copper or whether it is uh, optical fiber after some kilometers the signal becomes weak and to amplify that signal we put boosters so the booster will amplify the signal and it will send it further in the case of the optical fiber the number of boosters required are less as compared to the number of boosters which are required in the copper wire so number of boosters required in the optical fiber are less as compared to the number of boosters which are required in the case of the copper wire i have written this answer also on your screen question number 5 c part is on your screen optical fiber requires less number boosters for a length as compared to copper wire for of the same length i hope you have understood this idea okay so the next question on your screen is question number 6 Figure 6.1 shows a circuit that contains a resistor connected to a power supply of 6 volt and a lamp L. The resistor has a resistance of 60 ohm. The lamp is marked 6 volt 0.90 watt. A the a part is calculate the current in the resistor you know and this is a conceptual thing uh, here with this fixed resistor and this lamp they are parallel to each other plus they are parallel to the battery when two resistors are parallel to each other and parallel to battery each the voltage drop on each of them will be equals to the voltage of the battery so the voltage drop on the 60 ohm resistor will be 6 volt and the voltage drop on the lamp will be also 6 volt if i want to calculate how much current is flowing here you know i now know the resistance and i also know the voltage drop we know the formula v equals to i r if i want to find out i the formula will become v divided by r so v value is 6 and r value is 60 so the answer will be 0.1 amp so the current flowing through this branch or the fixed resistor is 0.1 amp i have done this on uh, on this a two mark numerical i have done this on a paper let me show you so on your screen you can see question number 6 a first part i is equals to v divided by r 6 divided by 60 equals to 0.1 amp so the current flowing through the fixed resistor 60 ohm resistor is 0.1 amp i hope you have understood it okay the next question is the current in the power supply the question is how much current is being provided from the power supply let me show you the diagram you can see this diagram again now till this point i know the current flowing here is 0.1 ampere so the question is how much current is flowing here in this branch in this branch i know the voltage drop is 6 volt and the power 0.9 watt For this lamp, you know the formula for the power. P 
equals to IV. P equals to IV. So I is equals to P divided by V. The value of the P is 0 0.9 watt and the value of the V is 6 volt. So 0 0.9 divided by 6 and the answer will be 0 0.15 amp. So the current flowing through this lamp is 0 0.15 amp. The current flowing for, through this branch is 0 0.1 amp. So add these two currents, the current in the branch one and the current in the branch two. So uh, it will be 0 0.1 amp plus 0 0.15 amp and the total answer will be 0 0.25 amp. So the current coming from the battery or the power supply is 0 0.25 amp. I have done this thing on a paper also. Let me show you. Okay. Now you see a second part. P is equals to IV. 0 0.90 equals to I into 6 and the I value will be 0 0.9 divided by 6 and the answer will be 0 0.15 amp. So the current from the battery will be the current in the first branch plus the current in the second branch. So I1 was 0 0.1 amp and the I2 is 0 0.15 amp. Add both of these currents. And the total current coming from the battery is 0 0.25 amps. I hope that you have understood the whole numerical and the whole procedure. Okay. So the B part is a second lamp is added to the circuit shown in the figure 6.1. The second lamp is in series with the 60 ohm resistor. But is not but is not in series with the lamp L. In the space below, draw a circuit diagram of this new circuit. The power supply 60 watt, 60 ohm resistor and lamp L have been drawn for you. You know, here I have to draw another lamp, like identical lamp to this one, and it is. Uh, in series with the 60 ohm resistor, so I will draw it here, and it is not in series with this lamp. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. Okay, question number six, B, first part. So here you can see that we have done this. I have connected a lamp in series with the 60 ohm resistor, but that lamp L2 is not in series with the lamp L1. So this is how you will draw that circuit diagram. Okay, I hope that you have understood. Okay, now the second part of the B is the two lamps are identical. Explain why the second lamp is dimmer than the lamp L. A calculation is not required. Okay, let me take you to the diagram. Okay, here you see. The voltage drop on this branch is 6 volt. The voltage drop on this branch is also 6 volt. But that voltage which is given to here on this first branch will be divided between the 60 ohm resistor and lamp 2. So the lamp 2 will be getting less than 6 volts. But this lamp L1 is getting all the 6 volts. So this L1 is getting the full 6 volts. This lamp L2 is getting less than 6 volts because some voltage in this branch is, is uh, used or voltage drop is done by the 60 ohm resistor. So L2 is getting the less voltage and L1 is getting more voltage. So L1 will be brighter and the L2 will be dimmer. I have written this answer also. Uh, I was trying to explain to you that how we came to know which one will be the dimmer and which one, one will be the brighter. Now look at C, uh, B second part. Voltage drop on both branches is equal, but voltage drop on lamp L1 is 6 volt, but the L2 will have less voltage drop than 6 volt, so L2 will be dimmer. It will be less bright. 
Okay, so that was the question number six. Now we will move to the next question, the question number seven. The question number seven is on your screen. A simple apparatus used to demonstrate electromagnetic induction is shown in figure 7.1. Here you have a spring and with that spring you have uh, hung a permanent magnet and that prominent magnet can move up and down. Here we have a coil and with this coil we have connected two light emitting diodes, LEDs, and they are connected in parallel to each other plus their arrows are in different directions. The coil is connected to two light emitting diodes, the magnet moves in and out of the coil. So magnet is moving up and down. The magnet is moving up and down. Explain why there is an induced EMF in the coil when magnet move. You know, when this magnet will move up and down, the magnetic, magnetic lines, its magnetic flux will be passing through the coil. And when it moves, the magnetic lines passing through the coil, they change. Due to the changing magnetic lines or due to the changing magnetic flux passing through the coil, EMF is induced in the coil. Okay. Uh, let me read my answer. It's a two marks uh, explanation. Let me read you. Let me read you my answer. I've done it on a paper. Question number seven, a part is on screen. When magnet moves, when magnet moves, its magnetic field lines passing through coil changes. So the magnetic field line passing through the coil will change. Due to change in magnetic flux passing through the coil, EMF is induced in the coil. Due to the changing magnetic flux through the coil, EMF is induced in the coil. Okay, B part is on your screen. Explain why one LED lights up when the magnet moves into the coil and the other LED lights up when the uh, magnet moves out of the coil. This is a two marks numerical. Let me show you that diagram. You see this coil, this magnet is coming downward and then that magnet is going upward. When this magnet is going, uh, coming downward, the EMF induced or the current induced, it will have a certain direction. And when this magnet will move upward, the direction of the EMF induced at that moment will be opposite to the direction of the current which was previously produced. So you see when the magnet is moving up and down, the EMF induced its direction is also changing. The current induced its direction is changing. So when the current is in one direction, one of the LEDs will be forward biased. The other one will be in the backward bias. So the LED which is in the forward bias will give light. When the direction of the current reverses, the first LED which was uh, uh, was giving light, that will become the back in the backward bias, and the second LED will become in the forward bias. Now the second LED will give out light. So you know, one LED always in the backward bias, and the other LED is all the. Uh, but out of two LEDs, one LED is always forward biased and the other one is always backward biased. So when the direction of the current changes, the one which was backward becomes in the forward biased and the one which was the forward biased becomes in the backward biased. So at that time, only one LED is giving out light. It's a little tricky description. Uh, let me show you my written answer. 
Okay, on your screen we have the B part, when magnets, when magnets moves down, when magnets move downwards, EMF induced has a certain direction. When magnet moves up, EMF induced has opposite direction. One LED is forward bias for one direction of current and backward bias for opposite direction of the current. So you see, one LED will lit at a moment. The other LED will be off and then the other will be on and the first one will be off. The reason is that the direction of the current is changing and you have uh, connected the LEDs in such a way that one LED is powered by at one moment. The other is at backward bias. A little tricky question. Okay, the next part. The LEDs are brighter when the magnet moves faster. Explain why. When the magnet moves faster, the magnet which is moving up and down attached with the spring, when the magnet moves faster, the rate of change of flux passing through the coil is also larger. The EMF induced in the coil is larger. So due to that larger EMF induced, the LEDs will be brighter. I've written this answer also. Let me read it for you. Question number seven, CPA. When magnets move faster, the rate of change of magnetic, magnet, magnetic flux passing through the coil is larger. So larger EMF is induced in the coil and LED gets larger voltage and larger amount of current. So LEDs will look more brighter. I hope you have understood it. Okay, dear students, we are moving to question number eight. On your screen, figure 8.1 shows the basic structure of a cathode ray oscilloscope, CRO. Some parts are missing. So here he has shown the filament, the anode, the glass tube, and the screen. It's a CRO, cathode ray oscilloscope. Electrons are emitted from the filament by a thermonic emission. Explain what is meant by a thermonic emission. Thermonic emission means that uh, when a filament or a, a node is hot, I said a node, when a cathode is hot or when a metal is hot. So what happens when a metal is hot, electrons, from inside the metal, they come out into the air. So see, when a metal or a cathode is very hot, the electrons from that metal come out into the air. This is called thermonic emission. I have written this definition also. Let me show you. Okay. The A part, thermonic emission is the liberation of electrons from an electrode by virtue of its temperature. I hope you have understood. Remember this definition, it always comes in paper. Okay, again two marks. Uh, question, it's B part of question number eight. Electrons hit the screen at high speed. Explain how electrons are made to travel at high speed, you know? from the filament, hot filament, when electrons, by the process of thermonic emission, they come out in the air. Then, and opposite to them, we have, uh, we place, uh, we place there uh, uh, anode. We put an anode in front of them. Anode is positively charged. And that anode, we keep it on a very, very high voltage. So what we have done due to thermonic emission, electrons came out of the filament. And what we have done, we have put an anode there. And that anode is positively charged. And that anode is at a very high voltage. So what will happen because the anode is positively charged, the electrons are negatively charged. So they will attract, they will have an electrostatic force of attraction. So that anode will attract the negative electrons and they will be accelerated. 
I hope you have understood it. I've written this answer also. Let me show you that. Here on the screen, you can see. It says we place an anode at very high voltage in CRO. Anode is positive and electrons are negative. Due to electrostatic force of attraction between negative and positive electrons are accelerated towards anode. Another thing which we do, uh, we keep a very low pressure in the CRO. So the movement of the electrons is not hindered. Because if there are air particles present in the CRO screen, the accelerated electrons, when they will collide with the air molecules, they will be stopped. This last line is uh, not necessary to write. I just, wrote, I just explained it for your knowledge. Okay. The C part is on your screen. The spot on the screen is made to move up and down and also across the screen. The parts of the CRO that make this happen are not shown in the figure 8.1. On figure 8.1, draw and label the parts that are needed. You know, uh, to move the, uh, the electron on the screen of the CRO from left to right, or what we call, we want to sweep the electron beam from left to right, right to left, or horizontal movement of the electron beam. For that purpose, we use X plates. These are the two plates through which the electron beam is passing. These are like this. Electron beam is passing between them. They are X plates. And for the vertical movement of the electron beam on the screen of the CRO, I mean the going up and down on the CRO, going up or down on the CRO screen. For that purpose, we use Y plates. Y plates are like this, and electron beam is passing between them. So electron Y plates. So we, we will put X plates and Y plates in the CRO screen. I have drawn a diagram on the paper. Uh, let me show you. So I hope you can see this diagram clearly. And you know, here I have tried to show the X plates. These are called X plates and these are called Y plates. Y plates are responsible for the vertical movement of the electron beam on the screen. And the X plates are responsible for the horizontal movement of the electron beam on the screen. So here you have to make the X plates and the Y plates. And I hope that you have understood. So my dear students, um, by this part, we have read the section B. So uh, that's it for the, today. Today we have done May, June, 2015. 2-1 paper. The course we are doing is Physics 5054. Today we have done only the section A of this paper. Section B of this paper we will do in another video. And I have tried my best uh, to explain all the concepts. And I hope that this video will be very helpful for you. And uh, thank you very much. Keep studying, keep working hard. I hope that your answering skills will improve. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. Have a good day.